Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another midweek Bible study. If this is your first time checking us out, welcome. My name is Samuel, and I'm the lead pastor here at CFWA. So we've been in a Bible study series going through the book of Psalms, and tonight we start book three. Now, book three is right in the middle of the Psalms in many ways, and you'll find that this book is, is very unique from the other books and from the other Psalms in that book. Now, if this is maybe your first or second time tuning in, as we've been going through the Psalms, we've been identifying where the Psalms find themselves in the overall book of Psalms. So the Psalms, or what's referred to as the Psalter, is made up of five books. And we're in book three, which begins with Psalm 73, and this goes all the way to around Psalm 89. And the Psalms are broken up that way because many believe that each book corresponds with the first five books of the Bible. So book one of the Psalms, which is from Psalm 1 to Psalm 41, corresponds with the book of Genesis. And you'll find the themes that, that are in Genesis in those groups of Psalms. Book two, which is from Psalm 42 to Psalm 72, corresponds with Exodus. And you find some of those same themes in those Psalms in Exodus. So with that being said, tonight we start with book three, and this corresponds with the book of Leviticus. And I'll explain why that is as we kind of go along with this psalm. But nonetheless, I'm excited about this, so let's go ahead and jump in. Now, this book, book three, and this psalm in particular, what you'll find is it raises questions that we all ask during the course of our lives. It raises questions like, why is the world the way it is? Why does it seem like some people get away with murder, literally? Why do the rich get richer? And why do the poor get poorer? Why does it seem like there is no justice? Even in our own time, we're asking questions like, why have so many died of COVID and yet there's still people who refuse to wear a mask? or I'll, I'll do you one better. Why are unarmed young black men repeatedly killed by police officers? These are the kinds of questions that we ask ourselves and we find these same kind of questions in this Psalm and especially in this book of Psalms. These are the kind of questions that we tend to ask as we go through life, as we, as we experience the world, as we see how the world works, as we find our place in the world and we see how that plays itself out. And this Psalm helps us to see that we aren't the only one that asks questions like this. This is a human thing. If we're human, we'll go through seasons of life where we ask these kinds of questions. And this psalm helps us make sense out of these kinds of questions. Now, this is one of the psalms that was written by Asaph, who was a Levite. Now, Levite comes from a word Leviticus, so this is where we're going to see some of the comparisons there. So the Levites, they were one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but in particular, they had the responsibility of overseeing the, the tabernacle in the wilderness, what was referred to also as the tent of meeting. It was the meeting place where people went to meet God. And the, the Levites were responsible for, for overseeing the tent of meeting under the direction of the high priest. And you can find that in Exodus chapter 38, verse 21, and also in Numbers 3 from verses 5 through 9. You'll find that spelled out. Now, during the time of King David, when, when David was king, he, he ushered in a whole new era and a whole new season of worship. Under David's leadership, the people of Israel stepped into a new realm of encountering God. And, and David, he appointed Levites to be musicians, to be singers, in addition to the roles that they already had of taking care of the place of worship. So the Levites, their main role was to make sure that sacred space remained sacred. 
very important as we go through this song. Now Asaph himself, who was a Levite, he was actually one of the senior music and worship leaders. And so he falls into that kind of category. And you can find that in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 from verses 4 through 7. Now, the Bible also says that Asaph was, was a seer. And a, a seer is just a way of describing a specific kind of spiritual vision and insight that determined what he said and also how he said it. Now, as you study the Bible, you'll find this concept of seer tied into the prophetic and prophets and how those things kind of like play in the same in the same sandbox and you might even hear people say there's a difference between a prophet and a seer won't get into any of that today but the bible does say that asaph was a seer which speaks to the kind of insight that he had based on what god revealed to him so asaph was a very unique powerful individual he was responsible for sacred space he was, he was responsible for helping people get into the space of worship. And he also had specific and keen insight based on what God revealed to him. And he writes this psalm along with 11 others. But this psalm that we're looking at tonight, this psalm reflects the perspective of someone who fights to maintain God's perspective in the midst of a world that has all types of stuff going on. So my, my hope is that as we go through this psalm, you would be ministered to, you would find comfort, and you would find perspective based on the days that we, even ourselves, live in right now. So sometimes we'll go through the entire psalm, we'll read it all the way through and then come back. But for this psalm, we're going to read and stop and read and stop. So we're going to read and then kind of add some commentary along the way to make sure that we're really getting what God would have for us to give. So I'm reading from the English Standard Version of Psalm 73. The first verse says this, Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now, this is really the main theme of the psalm, that when it's all said and done, God is good. In spite of what things look like, in spite of what things might seem like, God is good to his people. But the reality is sometimes his people wrestle with that truth in the face of realities in life. Verse 2, he says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. So, so Asaph now draws a contrast between himself and those who are pure in heart. Now the pure in heart are those who, who are single focused and they're not divided in their thought life. They're not divided in how they live life. Even Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. That that's all tied into the psalm. And it's all tied into this idea of Asaph being a seer based on what he writes in the psalm. So all those things really do work together. So the pure in heart are those who have insight to know that God is good. But Asaph said that, that he almost slipped. He almost stumbled. He almost lost his way. And he's going to explain why in the next verse, verse 3. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The prosperity of the wicked. What, what looks like worldly success. On top of that, those that seem to have worldly success, they boast about it and they walk in arrogance. That's that's kind of what Asaph is saying here. And listen, he keeps it real. He said he was, he was envious. When he, when he looked around and he saw how arrogant certain people were, and, and those same kinds of people, they looked like they had it all going on. 
They didn't want for anything. They had what was considered to be success. And he was envious. But there's some wisdom that, that we would need to pay attention to when it comes to this dynamic. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, it says this, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. So envy is when we want what someone else has based on comparison. And listen, comparison will trip us up every single time. And what the proverb says is that envy will eat us up on the inside. Now listen, if you've ever envied anything or if you've ever envied anybody, you know what I'm talking about. And you know what that feels like on the inside. Like something just, something happens on the inside when you have envy. And the scriptures teach us that that will rot the bones. It eats us up on the inside. Now back to Psalm 73, the next nine verses from verse three outline what this prosperity of the wicked looks like. So, so Asaph spells it out for us. Verse four, he says, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. So just to pause right there, these two verses, verses four and five, sum up this idea that it seemed like some people have no pain in life. It looks like they have no problems. They have no issues. They have no stress. And in many ways, they can buy their way out of anything. Hmm. Verse 6, he says, Therefore, because of that, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them as a garment. Now, this is very poetic language here. Like, he's painting us a picture for us to really make sense out of what he's saying. Now, the Hebrew in the first part of this verse reads, um, pride necklaces them. <laughs> so, so pride is like an ornament. Pride is around their neck. They, they parade it. Pride surrounds them, and they wear it, and they show it off. And violence covers them as a garment. In other words, everywhere they go, what you see is violence. The trail they leave behind is violence. Verse 7, their eyes swell out through fatness and their hearts overflow with follies. In other words, these people are so at ease, they're just comfortable. They're just sitting around gaining weight. They ain't got to do anything, you know what I mean? And in, in the Hebrew context, the heart and the mind really work together. They aren't necessarily two distinct things that are in competition with one another. They, they work together. For example, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So those things kind of work together. So when it says that their hearts overflow with follies, the idea is that they think about all kinds of foolishness without limits. So they have no limitation to the folly that's in their minds. Now, sometimes in the Bible, that word folly is translated as, as idol or as a graven image. So in other words, what they think about is idols. They think about things that they put on a pedestal or if they put themselves on a pedestal. Let me put it in these terms. They think in terms of supremacy. Uh, I'm just going to leave that right there and move on to the next verse. <laughs> verse 8. They scoff and they speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. Oh my gosh. Now this is, this is what Elder Winston calls sadidi. Okay, this is what this verse is telling us here. That these people are stuck up and they speak from a high place. They speak from a lofty place because they place themselves above everybody else. And maybe because they have the resources to do it, they have the clout to do it. But in any event, they put themselves above others. They elevate themselves above others. 
maybe in a sense of supremacy, and they speak from that place, and they make threats from that place. They scoff at people from that place. They denigrate people from that place. They discriminate against people from that place. Verse 9, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Now, they, they talk as if everything belongs to them to the point that they even speak against God himself. Now, listen, that's when you really are necklaced with pride. That's when you'll really like sadiddy. When you even start talking against God. Because remember, the scripture says that, that their folly is without limits. Their hearts overflow with follies. They think they have no limitation to the foolishness of their imaginations. Now, the, this is hard for a person like, like Asaph. Because remember, as, as a Levite, he is responsible for sacred space. And these kinds of people, the arrogant, the wicked, the boastful, the scoffers, these people talk and live as if nothing is sacred. So you can imagine that a, a person like Asaph, who knows what it is to maintain sacred space, when he sees people act as if nothing is sacred, they talk as if nothing is sacred, they live as if Nothing is sacred. And everywhere they go, they desecrate. They eliminate sacredness wherever they are. There is no sacredness to human life. There is no sacredness to the dignity of diversity. There is no sacredness to people. Okay. Now, what you'll notice is in these last few verses, Asaph mentions eyes, heart, mouth, tongue, and that's because he's talking about the totality of who they are. So this, this idea of, of boastful, mocking, arrogant, like it, it infects and it affects all of who they are. That's why he uses um, this language that is from parts of the body. Verse 10, he says, therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Now, notice that these people, these, these individuals, they don't deny the existence of God. They just don't think God is aware or is concerned about what is happening. And many of us wrestle with that. And these are, these are kind of the questions that, that Asaph is asking and that we ask when we look at what's going on. It's almost as if certain people live life like, God doesn't care how we live down here. God isn't paying attention. So we might as well just do us. You know, we might as well cut corners, rob, cheat, steal, shoot, kill, acts of injustice. Verse 12, he says, Behold, these are the wicked. If you wanted to have an idea of who the wicked are or what their lives are like, he just spelled it out for us. These are the wicked, always at ease, and they increase in riches. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with riches. There's nothing wrong with having resources. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. But the Bible teaches us that the love of money and how it drives us is the root of all evil. Money isn't, but the love of it is the root of all evil. If that's all we see, if that's all we're after, then we'll do whatever it takes to get it. And he says that, that these people who he says are the wicked, it seems like they're always at ease and they increase in riches. These are the kinds of people that even though we're in a recession, their salaries double. Oh, come on, you know what I'm talking about? That kind of thing. Verse 13, Asaph says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean 
and washed my hands in innocence. So it's almost as if he's saying this. What's the point? I'm following God. I'm trusting God. I'm obedient to God, but I'm still struggling. And people who don't follow God, who don't trust God, and do the opposite of his word, and who are disobedient, they got all this money, and they just live in life, and nothing bad seems to happen to them. Like they're always smiling in the pictures, on these yachts, on the boat. They sur- this is what, and this is what Asaph is also saying, and his point is, why, why am I? being so committed to God and those who are not committed to God, they ain't got no issues. They don't have 99 problems. You know what I mean? Like they ain't got no problems. But here I am trying to be faithful to God, trying to live right, trying to be right. And I am struggling. This is where Asaph is at. Verse 14. He says, for all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Verse 15, if if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. In other words, even though he's wrestling with this, even though he has all of these questions, he's basically saying, if I were to speak this out, given my role, I would betray those who are trying to place their faith in God. So Asaph understood the position he was in. And as a Levite, and as someone who was responsible for keeping sacred space sacred, for someone who was responsible for helping people connect with God, he knew that what he says matters. And this is an important principle for anyone who has influence over people. You know that if anybody is following you, if, if, if you have oversight or responsibility over people, you know that what you say matters. And we've seen the consequence of this in the last few years. People who are in positions of authority, what they say matters. Verse 16, he says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. He says, as he's trying to think about all of this, he's tired. He doesn't know where where it's going to end or where it's going to land. Look at verse 17. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned therein. In other words, once I got into God's environment and saw things the way he does, then I got understanding. Then all the stuff that he was seeing started to make sense. Because remember, the sanctuary was a sacred space and his responsibility was to maintain sacred space. So when he got into the environment of God, then he he understood, okay, I get it. I know where this is going now. Because that sacred space was the place where people came face to face with what is real. It is in the presence of the sacred that we come face to face with reality. It is in the presence of God that we experience what's really real. Because a lot of things are not real. It may look like, come on, it's real. But it's not real. It's only when we get into the environment of God and we hear God's word that we then start to see with clarity what really is real. And what God reveals in that sacred space makes all the difference in the world. Because he says this in verse 18, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. 
like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as, as phantoms. Now remember in verse 2 of this psalm, Asaph says, I almost stumbled. I nearly slipped. But now he's saying that he's not the one who's really slipping. The wicked are the ones who are slipping. And they are the ones who are on the road to self-destruction. Verse 21, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. So he says, when I was looking at injustice and how the wicked were prospering, I got bitter. And he's being real. He says, when my soul was embittered and when I was pricked in heart. Now, as we've been going through the Psalms, we've been saying how the Psalm gives us language for our prayers. The Psalms gives us words to use when we don't know what to say in given situations. And this is an example. Asaph is using his words to describe his experience. He says, I was embittered. I was bitter in my soul. I was pricked in my heart. I was, I was hurt. I was offended. I was angry. Because he confessed earlier that he was envious of the arrogant. And here's what we know. Envy will always invite bitterness to the party. Every time. If you entertain envy long enough, bitterness is going to step into that door and say, yo, what's up? Every time. And bitterness has a way of making us angry. And when we get angry, we don't think. We just react. And listen, everyone watching me at one point or another has been angry. And you know when you get angry, you start to breathe a little bit heavy. Your, blood, your, your heart starts racing. For most guys, we start to swell up our chest. And we just, like, we don't think rationally when we're angry. We just react. We'll think later, and then we'll say, man, I shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have, whatever the case was. That's what anger does. But look at verse 24. He says, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Oh, man, this is one of the most comforting verses in all of the Psalms. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. God guides us all the way to glory. And I just, I, I just want to read that verse again over some of you who might be watching, and maybe you've lived life. Maybe you're in the twilight of your life. Maybe you've seen all the stuff that Asaph is talking about. You've seen the injustices. You've seen how things just seem upside down in the world. Maybe you've worked for most of your life, and you see how people, maybe half your age, are just throwing money up in the air, literally. Like, they just got money everywhere. And maybe you feel a little bit envious. Maybe you feel a little bit bitter about that. And maybe you're thinking, did I do enough? Should I have done something different? Have I really left something behind for my family? Is God pleased with my life? Is God happy with me? Will God really say, well done? Here's what I want to say to you. God has guided you with his counsel and he will receive you to glory. Oh, please sit with that. God will receive you to glory. In Jesus' name. Verse 25, Asaph continues. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. So instead of envying other people, instead of desiring what other people have, especially those that are on the right 
on the wrong path, Asaph acknowledges that he really and rightly desires God. That's where our desires should be because that's the only person that really knows what we need deep down. When we pursue and desire God, that's a desire that's rightly oriented. That's a desire that's going in the right way. Now, this, this has to be a constant reality check for us every day. This question, do I really want God? Listen, don't just say yes, <laughs> because if we sit quietly long enough and we ask this question, we might get challenged. If we look at our bank statements, if we look at what we spend our time doing, if we look at where we go, if we think about what we think about, the way my wife would say, this may be a hard question. Do I really want God? Or would I rather have fill in the blank? Verse 26, he says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The, the body may get weak, the body may get tired, the body may even give out. But he says, because he has perspective, because he has insight, God is the strength or the rock of his heart. And he says, he is my portion or my inheritance or what belongs to me. God belongs to me. And I belong to God. That's something that's good to say every day when you look in the mirror. The last two verses, verse 27, he says, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. What Asaph is saying is what's best for me and what's best for us is to be near to God. Closeness of God is what we really need. He says those who are far, they will perish. Those who are on the wrong path, they're going to get what's theirs. But when we stay close to God, we're going to get what's ours. Come on. And that's God himself. Closeness to God. May that be what we desire most in our lives. Now, sometimes that might be easier said than done. That's just real talk. But that doesn't mean we should not go after it every day. We should not pursue it every day. The closeness of God. The closeness of God. The presence of God being aware of his nearness, being aware that he is with us, that he really is good. It may not feel like it. It may not look like it, but he really is good. And trust me, he will prove that to be true. He will. He always has and he always will be. God is good. Father, thank you. And Lord, my, my prayer tonight is that these words would not fall on stony ground. That these words would not be choked up. But that these words would produce a harvest in the hearts of all of those who really do want you. God, we live in a world that has all types of stuff going on. All types of injustice. All types of corruption. God, it just seems like people who are doing the wrong thing are getting the right things in our eyes. But Lord, help us to, to be in sacred spaces so that we can know what's real. 
Lead us, guide us, God. You are the strength of our hearts. You are our portion forever. We want you, God. Sometimes we may not live like it, we may not talk like it, we may not think like it, but Lord, we know that we need you and we want you. So Lord, I pray that these words would produce a hundredfold return in our lives. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you all. I hope this was a blessing to you. Now, we may not have gotten into some things that are in this psalm, but the goal is that you'd be reading this in your own time of devotional study and that God would be ministering to you as you continue to grow in faith. So have a great rest of your week. Come on back and worship with us on Sunday if this is your first time checking us out. Love to be with you. Love to worship with you. Christ family, love you all. Have a great week.